It is therefore time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of the Environment. There are a lot of unanswered questions for the people of Chemical Valley in Ontario, located between Sarnia and Amgenon First Nations. For nine years, for nine long years, we have asked this government for answers, and for nine years they have been ignored. There were 500 government reports documenting industrial environmental concerns in the Sarnia region over a two-year period. That's nearly 500 incidents where this government had failed to take action. 500 incidents where the people of Sarnia deserved answers. Mr. Speaker, how has this government ignored the people and the workers in Chemical Valley for so many years, for almost a decade? Mr. Speaker, it's astonishing. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and it's, uh, I'm delighted to, uh, to uh, respond to uh, the member opposite. It's the, uh, I think since my time in the House, it's the first time I've heard a question uh, like this. Chief about government, quite well. frankly. But let me, let me tell you this, uh, Speaker, it's a fundamental fact that everyone, every person in this, country, this great country, this great province of ours, deserves clean air to breathe, clean water to drink, and clean land to walk upon. You know, and we continue to reflect that in the actions of this government. You know, everything from eliminating dirty coal plants to moving forward with our ministry's uh, government's climate change action plan. You know, Speaker, Answer. The, the air quality has improved over the past 10 years, and we recognize there's more to be done, Thank you. and we will support. Thank you. Smart enough not to look at me. <coughs> Supplement. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of the Environment. The Minister pretends they haven't heard of this. The member for Sarnia Lambton has responses from three Liberal ministers saying that they're not responding. This has been brought up for nine years, so it's a little too convenient to say you haven't heard about it when your government, your ministers, have responded in writing. We have proof that you did not take this seriously. Now, in Sarnia, Mr. Speaker, there is a term the government uses, no field response. It's become well known because it is associated with the government's failure to take action and protect the people in chemical value. When a report of an environmental concern in Sarnia, there always seems to be the government's response, no field response. There's a joint report that reveals in 2014 a detailed incident where 338 kilograms of ammonia was spilled. It received from the government Question. a no field response. Same thing in March of 2014, and again in January 2016, when SO2 emissions were well beyond the regulation. Mr. Speaker, Thank you. I'm tired of the, of the no response. Do you want action? Thank you. You say it, please. You say it, please. I, uh, I've been getting signals, and I'm going to respond to them. The interjections will stop. Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the opportunity to clarify. And what I want to clarify is the fact that this is the first time that I've heard the Leader of the Opposition talk about Sarnia. It's nice to, nice to have some interest there. So, Speaker, let me, let me just say a few things. You know, the, the Sarnia Air Action Plan, it was, a, it was initiated to address community concerns, improve local ministry programs, and reduce the ambient concentrations of air contaminants identified as priorities in the Sarnia area. You know, by law, Speaker, all spills must be reported to our Spills Action Centre. That centre is open 24-7 and takes all phone calls and addresses all of them. It's open. Member from Dufferin Caledon, come to order. Well, you can point to the clock all you want. Your own members were heckling.
Wrap up sentence, please. Well, I just wanted to say, Speaker, that we're going to continue our collaboration with the community, with the Indigenous organizations and business community in Sarnia to make sure we get it Thank right. You. The member from Prince Edward Hastings come to order. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of the Environment, you know, they can be operated 24-7, but when the only response we have to spills is no response, it's not good enough. Right. I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, but he's not taking this seriously enough. For nine years, the member from Sarnia Lambton and his community have been fighting for the government to wake up and realize there's a serious concern here, but they have not. You know, the government's another talking point from the government is they have some of the strictest limits. But, Mr. Speaker, those limits don't exist if they exempt companies like they have. You know, critics have called this lack of oversight a clear example of environmental racism and that the government has turned their backs on First Nations communities. The Minister of the Environment says everything's fine and he's doing his job. But this isn't the case. Mr. Spe Speaker, we cannot ignore the warning. Please. Mr. Speaker, the minister is saying they've had no warnings. They've had warnings in 2008, in 2010, in 2016, but they've turned their back on the people of Chemical Valley. So, Mr. Speaker, rather than point fingers, rather than say everything is fine, will the minister Question. finally take responsibility and stop letting down, stop failing the people of Sarnia there and Mjinwen First Nations? Thank you. Please. Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. And I, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm delighted to keep talking about the, uh, the progress that the province. Member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound, come to order. We are now in warnings. Carry on. Well, thank you, Speaker. I'm delighted to be able to continue and talk about the things that, uh, that we're doing right across on. The member from North, uh, Niagara West Glanbrook is warned. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, delighted to continue talking about the things that we're doing to improve air quality right across Ontario. You know, Speaker, we're building on previous regulations to, to lower air pollution. We're committed to funding, uh, and we are committed to funding a health study of local Sarnia residents. We've been very clear about that. You know, we'll be, we'll be announcing stricter regulations in the coming weeks, and as I said, we are committed to funding that science-based approach to, to understanding yes, the localized impact of air pollution on the health of Sarnia residents. Thank you. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the President of the Treasury Board. Students want to learn, and the faculty want to teach. But as of midnight last night, Ontario colleges are on strike. 12,000 faculty and 500,000 students are impacted across the province. Mr. Speaker, will the Liberals assure the House they will get both sides back to the bargaining table today? Thank you. President, President Board. Minister of Advanced Education. Minister of Advanced Education. Well, thank you, thank you uh, for the question, Speaker. It's very clear that students are our top priority, and our college students who are not at school today need to know that all sides are working with the students as the highest priority speaker. You know, our college system, Ontario, is extraordinary. For 50 years, it has been training, uh, training people, speaker. Over half a million people are actually in class or taking the courses right now, speaker. Um, Nearly 2 million students over those 50 years have actually attended or graduated from our college, Speaker, and they get terrific results. If I knew who it was, they would be gone, I think. Um, Ninety percent of employers say that they are satisfied or very satisfied with the college grads. This yes, is important work. We're urging both sides to get back to the table. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Mr. Speaker, back uh, to the minister. Uh, the college system is extraordinary, but when students are in the classroom, students aren't learning. They're not learning at Algonquin, Cambrian, Canador, Centennial, College Barrier, Conestoga, Confederation, Durham, Fanshawe, Fleming, George Brown, Georgian, Humber, La Cité Collégiale, Lambton, Loyalist, Mohawk, Niagara, Northern, Sioux, Seneca, Sheridan, St. Clair, and St. Lawrence, 24 great colleges where students are not in the classroom. That's 24 colleges where faculty are on the picket lines fighting for a fair deal. That's 24 colleges where we need provincial leadership so we have students in the classroom. So my question, Mr. Speaker, directly to the dire Deputy Premier, is what is the Premier doing today to make sure that both sides are back at the bargaining table and we have students back in the classroom? Thank you. Thank you. Can you see that, please? Can you see that, please? Thank you. Minister? Well, Speaker, on this side of the House, we actually respect the collective bargaining process, and of course, we want both sides to get back to the table. We want students back in the classroom as quickly as possible. We believe in post-secondary education. We believe in eliminating financial barriers to students in colleges and in universities, which is why we have totally transformed OSAP. Speaker, we're seeing tremendous success with the changes to OSAP. Over 50,000 more students have applied for OSAP this year than at the same time last year. Speaker, we believe in post-secondary education. Our record is very, very strong. I wish, Speaker, of course, that both sides will get back and resolve this dispute. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the, the minister. You know, the minister's talking about OSAP, and you know, student assistance is something we all support, but if you can't actually have a classroom to go into, what does that do? We need to have classrooms where students can learn, and the government's not taking this seriously. How about respecting the faculty? How about respecting the students? How about understanding the urgency that exists here? They can't do this while they're out of the classroom. Students can't learn and appreciate our extraordinary college system if they're not in school. I know that one day of a strike is too long, and the government can just ignore this and allow it to, to go on. But what I want and what I'm pushing for is that we get a commitment that the Premier is going to take this seriously and the Premier is going to do everything she can to get both sides back to the table and get students back in class. Well, um, Speaker, under the uh, uh, College's Collective Bargaining Act 2008, the uh, colleges, the employers are represented by the College Employer Council, and they have the exclusive right and responsibility to negotiate. The government itself is not at the table. However, Speaker, we are committed to success of our college students. And if the member opposite actually wanted to support students, he would be supporting our policy on free tuition. That's great. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My uh, first question is for the acting premier. Brantford General Hospital has been o operating well over capacity throughout 2017. According to internal documents released this morning, Brantford Hospital's acute care beds reached a shocking 120 per cent capacity in January. I just want to remind the government that 85 per cent capacity is considered the safe level of occupancy in hospitals. We've seen numbers similar to this speaker over and over again for hospitals all across the province. Why isn't the government taking the pro uh, problem of hospital overcrowding and hallway medicine seriously? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We absolutely are taking uh, the priorities of our hospitals as our priority, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we invested an additional half billion dollars for operating costs for hospitals around this province in this year's budget, and it followed a similar amount of money, roughly a half a billion dollars, last year. But, Mr. Speaker, we're working very closely with Brantford Hospital. In fact, Brantford is facing a number of challenges. We, in fact, we have a supervisor in place there that is dealing with a number, a broad range of challenges that that important community hospital is facing. We increased their budget this year alone by $3 million. But most importantly, Mr. Speaker, we're taking the good advice of our 
supervisor who is working with the uh, frontline staff, with the, uh, the uh, administrators of the hospital, with the community, to make sure that that community hospital is able to serve effectively uh, in all ranges, including the capacity, the number of beds that are available, Answer. the state of their ER, all aspects that it's able to serve that community well. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, it would seem that the members opposite have not been listening to patients, to families, and to health care workers on the front lines. Brantford General is also struggling to keep up with demand in its mental health beds. The hospital reached 108 uh, percent last summer in terms of capacity and stayed well above the safe 85 percent capacity throughout 2017 in their mental health beds. Does the government believe that it's okay for Brantford General Hospital to be at 120 percent capacity of its acute care beds and 108 percent capacity of its mental health care spaces? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are, uh, our attention is focused on a Brant uh, Community Health Care System, the Brantford Hospital, uh, particularly because, as I mentioned, we have, and it's an unusual situation in this province, but we have a supervisor in place. So the board has been dissolved, Mr. Speaker. We have a supervisor that is there because we understand there are a number of challenges being faced. And we want that supervisor working with the local community and working with the hard working administrators and frontline health care staff at Brant to provide the best quality of care to the community that it serves. That is our objective, Mr. Speaker, and we're doing that in the face of making substantial investments, as I mentioned, uh, more than three million new dollars this year alone going to Brant. Uh, a lot of that uh, investment, in fact, is going specifically to address uh, some of the wait time challenges that they're facing. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, we, with the supervisor in place, yes, we continue to support the efforts of the health care system in Brant as they work towards delivering the highest quality of care for the patients in that community. Thank you. Final supplement. Well, Speaker, what's unfortunately not, it, not unusual in this province is overcapacity hospital beds from one end of Ontario to the other. Hospital administrators and frontline health care workers are doing everything they can with what they've been given by this Liberal government. But it's not enough, Speaker. Hospitals in Peterborough, Brantford, Etobicoke, Brampton, Toronto and Oshawa are all overcrowded, and the Premier has seen seen the proof in the numbers. She's seen the proof in the horror stories that are flooding into her office, I'm sure, as they are every office of every MPP in this House. And she has seen the proof in the form of a public letter from the Ontario Hospital Association calling on her to immediately fund hospitals at an adequate level. What else do the people of Ontario need to do, Speaker, to make the government take this crisis in our hospitals seriously? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, here's what we should not do. We should not take uh, our lead from the NDP when they were in government, when they closed 24 per cent of the acute care beds in the entire province, or when they closed 13 per cent of all the mental health beds in the province. The PCs, as I've mentioned, frequently closed almost, almost 10,000 hospital beds. The NDP closed 9,600 hospital beds during their brief tenure as government, Mr. Speaker. We won't take our advice from their track record, which is massive closure of hospital beds, massive cuts, in fact, to the hospital system and to the health care budget as a whole. We won't do that, Mr. Speaker. We've been investing in our hospitals year after year after year, and we'll continue to do so. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the acting premier. This weekend, we learned through shocking news reports that the people of Sarnia have been exposed to dangerous, toxic chemicals for many, many years. The result of industrial leaks from the city's Chemical Valley. There were over 500 separate incidents. 500 separate incidents in Sarnia in 2014-2015, including one leak in 2014 that saw an unsafe level of benzene released into the atmosphere. The toxic plume reached nearby residential neighbourhoods, but families were never told what the odour was or if it was dangerous. Can the Acting Premier explain why the people of Sarnia were not warned by the Ministry of the Environment about a cancer-causing chemical wafting towards their front doors? Thank you. Thank you. The Minister of Environment and Climate Change. For the Environment and Climate Change. 
Well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you for that, uh, that important question, as usual. And I'll start by restating a, a very fundamental fact uh, to this government, Speaker, and to all of us here in the House, that every person in Ontario deserves to breathe clean air. And, you know, we continue to reflect that very fundamental philosophy in all of the actions that we undertake uh, in this government. You know, everything from eliminating uh, dirty coal plants to, to moving forward with our climate change action plan. You know, Speaker, uh, the, the, the general air quality in Sarnia has improved over the past 10 years, in part because we are listening and consulting with uh, Indigenous communities. We are listening and consulting with the public and with business in those areas to make sure that we get, uh, that we get it right and we, as we Answer. tighten regulations. Supplementary. Speaker, philosophical platitudes are useless when there's a toxic plume wafting up to your front door. The February 8, 2014 spill saw benzene levels in the air as high as 50 parts per billion, 22 times the provincial standard. Benzene is carcinogenic, Speaker. The World Health Organization says that no amount of benzene can be considered safe. This incident risked the lives, the health at least, of every single person in Sarnia. Yet the Ministry of the Environment, whose job it is to investigate when spills happen, didn't even bother Bother to send someone out to see what went wrong. When did the minister and when did the premier learn of this dangerous spill, Speaker? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I'm, I'm glad uh, for the opportunity to uh, to be able to talk about uh, benzene, which we know is a, a very dangerous chemical. Right. You know, Speaker, uh, benzene levels in Sarnia have greatly decreased compared to what they were in the 1980s and the uh, 1990s. In fact, the, the, average, the annual average benzene concentration is now about a third of what it was 25 years ago. But, you know, that's not good enough, Speaker. So in 2016, a new air standard for benzene came into effect. Uh, it resulted in seven petrochemical and petroleum refining facilities in the Sarnia area taking action to reduce benzene emissions through technical standards by applying the best available technology. Answer. We're going to continue to push to make sure the air gets cleaner all the time, Speaker. Good to know. That's good. Final supplementary. The government and the Premier just can't seem to get the basics right, Speaker, whether it's skyrocketing hydro bills, overcrowded hospitals, or chronic chemical spills and leaks that endanger the lives and people in Sarnia. In 2009, Speaker, the government agreed to review the cumulative air pollution in hot spots like Sarnia. In 2009, they made a commitment to do the heavy lifting to research what was happening in these hot spots when it comes to cumulative air pollution. Eight years later, the results of the review are nowhere to be seen, Speaker. Has the review happened? Is my question to this government. Has it happened? And where are the results? Thank you. Minister? Well, thank you, Speaker. That, I'm, I'm really delighted to be able to talk about uh, our commitment to funding a health study to, uh, to understand the, the localized impact of air pollution on Sarnia residents. And I think oh, understanding good. that localized impact is, is what's really key uh, in terms of, uh, of, of how we figure out moving ahead. Um, we'll also be taking some further steps to ensure that the air quality is improved. You know, last week, Speaker, I was in Sarnia. I was meeting with the First Nations to hear their concerns firsthand, and I'm committed to building on previous efforts to reduce air pollution and ensure all Ontarians have clean air to breathe. We are committed to that study, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, a member from Melton Middlesex, London. Community Safety and Correctional Services. Ontario's correction system is in a disaster, and our probation and parole system is a joke. Jails are overcrowded, and cell block violence is out of control. Most inmates are held in maximum security without access to rehab programs. Assaults on correctional officers and staff have more than doubled over the past seven years, and sadly, these detention centers are often understaffed and often lack the resources to deal with the violence. Regarding probation and parole, often the only contact between a criminal and probation officer happens when the offender visits the probation office. After the offender leaves, there is little to no follow-up, again because 
of a lack of resources. Check the report by the Independent Advisor on Corrections Reform if you doubt what I'm saying. The Liberal Party Speaker has done nothing to fix the problems in the past 14 years. So, Speaker, Question. to the Minister, why have the Liberals allowed the crisis in corrections to fester so long? Here, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate actually the uh, member of the opposite for his questions this morning because I want to say thank you to the men and women who works actually and commend them for their enormous work in our institutions all across. We have 26 institutions. Certainly, our ultimate goal is a truly modern and compassionate system. Uh, whether it's through working with the Ministry of Health to ensure our health care outcomes and our better health care outcomes in our system, or through the construction of two new facilities in Ottawa and Thunder Bay, which will serve as models wow. of innovation and renewal. I am proud of the progress that we're making, Mr. Speaker, and just so the member opposite actually knows our government's plan to transform uh, Ontario's correction system did not start today. And I want to read a few things Answer. that we always tend to forget. We hired over 1,600 new correction officers. We created wow. 60 new mental Thank health you. nurses. And Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Uh, speaker, over the weekend, I published an opinion piece in, on, on Ontario's crisis and corrections. It appeared in the Toronto Sun, and I shared it on Twitter. I appreciated the favorable responses from correction officers and my constituents, but I was shocked at the fatuous response from the Director of Communications to the Corrections Minister. He broadcast a series of false accusations and personal attacks against me. He deleted his most offensive tweet, but failed to apologize. The conversation can otherwise still be seen on my Twitter feed. I have been on top of this file for years. I have a strong personal relationship with correctional officers, and I have their back, and they have mine. I've spoken about the crisis in corrections many times in this House. To suggest otherwise, Speaker, is preposterous and mischievous. So, Minister, did you instruct your DCOM to reply to my op-ed in that boorish manner, and will you apologize? Mr. Speaker, I want to continue, and I hear the questions, but I want to continue because the op-ed was referring to what we have not done and, and this crisis in correction. And I want to say, as I visited institutions in the past months, every single institution that I visit makes reference to actually the track record of this party as to all the cuts and the privatization oh, fail that they've tried. So let's go back to the point here, Mr. Speaker, which is, I have to say, we created 60 new mental health nurses, enhance our mental health training. We introduced new and improved policies on segregation. And the member opposite and the PC party seem to be capable of uninformed criticism and incapable Answer. of putting forward an actual plan. Since the party people have no plan, Mr. Speaker, I can only judge Thank them you. on their record. Thank you. New question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, to the acting premier. Nearly two years ago, the Premier gave Hydro One a $2.6 billion departure tax gift, wiping away a departure tax that became due at the time of sell-off. The rules set by the Ontario Energy Board say that tax benefits like this must go to ratepayers. But instead, Hydro One demanded that its private investors keep the benefit and not ratepayers. On October 13, the Ontario Energy Board sided with Hydro One, giving its private investors 71 per cent of this $2.6 billion tax gift. Wow. Wow. Why didn't the government direct the OEB to stick to its own precedent and give 100 per cent of this tax benefit to ratepayers, as the NDP demanded a year ago? Yeah. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, when it comes to the Ontario Energy Board, let's start, Mr. Speaker, in recognizing that they are an independent regulator with a mandate to protect the interests of Ontario ratepayers. And I know they can heckle, Mr. Speaker. They like it one day, they don't like it the next, but that's the fact, Mr. Speaker. And the board reduced Hydro One's ask by $278 million over two years for administrative and capital expenditure costs, Mr. Speaker. This was a reduction of almost 10 percent of what they asked for. And this is a great example of the OEB's strong record of denying hydro companies all that they asked for and reviewing rate applications with the consumer in mind first, Mr. Speaker. And over the past 10 years, the OEB has denied or reduced the outcome of rate applications many times. In 2010, with Hydro One, when it asked for a rate uh, increase on distribution, and 2012, when Ontario Power Generation applied for a 6.2% rate increase Answer. in 2011, Mr. Speaker, the OEB's mandate is to protect the interest of ratepayers, and they're doing just that. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Acting Premier. Astonishingly, the privatized Hydro One was not satisfied with 71 per cent of that $2.6 billion tax gift from the provincial government. Imagine, imagine. Hydro One is actually taking the OEB to court to demand that it gets 100 per cent of that tax gift. Wow. Clearly, the privatized Hydro One will not accept regulation by the OEB and will do whatever it can to claim profits for, it pri for its private investors at ratepayer expense. Wow. The privatized Hydro One will even sue the OEB and demand that ratepayers continue paying $2.6 billion for taxes the government is no longer making it pay. Oh. Will the government stop the privatized Hydro One Question. from extracting another $2.6 billion from ratepayers? Ah. You it, please? You it, please? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The province is going to continue to review the decision carefully and monitor the appeal as it moves through the process, Mr. Speaker. But again, this is being done by the independent arms-like regulator of the province's energy sector, the OEB. And as part of uh, that decision, Mr. Speaker, as I said before, the board uh, reduced Hydro One's ask by $278 million over two years for administrative and capital expenditure costs. And this is a reduction of almost 10 percent of what Hydro One asked for. Mr. Speaker, when you're talking about cuts, let's not forget that our Fair Hydro Plan reduced everyone's bills by 25 percent on averages right across the province and also helping small businesses and farms. And the appeals of OEB decisions are not uncommon, Mr. Speaker. In 2013, OPG uh, appealed a pension ruling, which was later ruled upon by the Supreme Court of Canada. The province, again, Mr. Speaker, will continue to Answer. review this decision carefully and monitor the appeal as it moves through the process. Thank, Thank you. you. New question, the member from Center. Thanks very much, Speaker. My question is for the minister responsible for small business. Uh, minister, in Etobicoke Centre, in my riding, we have many small businesses, but even more so, we have many small business owners that call Etobicoke Centre home. And as you know, you've heard me say before, my background is in business and I used to consult the businesses. In fact, I actually at one point owned my own small business. So you won't be surprised to hear that I want to ask you about the fact that we're marking the start of Small Business Week in Canada. And Speaker, uh, Speaker you know, it's important for everyone to know that Ontario has one of the strongest, most vibrant small business communities in Canada. And small businesses actually make up 98% uh, of businesses in Ontario. So it's important that we acknowledge their hard work and their contributions. So my question to you, Minister, is can you tell us what our government is doing to support small business in Ontario? Thank you, Minister responsible for small business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Etobicoke Centre for his question this morning. At his right, he had a very distinguished career in the business committee here in Toronto. And of course, uh, just recently, he was very active with the Bloor Street West DBIA for the Ukrainian festival in his communities. But we want to make sure uh, that we continue to foster the right conditions for more than 400,000 small businesses in Ontario to succeed and grow. Just this morning, I joined the Ontario Chamber of Commerce to announce our partnership on a new service we're launching to better support small businesses called the Small Business Access. This new service will help entrepreneurs and small businesses better access tools to start and grow a business. But Mr. Speaker, that's not all. We're also designating 33 per cent 
of government contracts to small businesses by the year 2020 and further improving the procurement process for small business. And these measures are just some of what's to come, Mr. Yes, Speaker. Sir. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank, thank you, Minister. Uh, it's great to hear that you're doing all this, this important work. And I know that uh, as a small business owner, I know that, or someone who was a small business owner, I know that um, business people take on a lot of risks. They don't just work hard, but they also invest a lot of their own capital. They put aside their careers to pursue their small businesses. And these, these small businesses end up providing a livelihood, not just for them and their families, but they create jobs for hundreds of thousands of other Ontarians, really millions of other Ontarians. So I'm glad to hear about the measures you're talking about. Um, when I speak to small business owners, Minister, I often hear about other things that, that the government could do to help small business owners. Sometimes they talk to me about input costs. Sometimes they talk to me about regulations. So as much as I'm glad to hear about the things that you've just spoken about, can you tell us more about what you're doing to help small businesses? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Etobicoke Centre for his supplementary. I've had the opportunity to hear from small business owners across the province about the challenges that they face and how our government can help them succeed in a changing global economy which is why we made committed to working with these small businesses to create the conditions for them to succeed. We've already eliminated the capital tax and lowered the small business tax rate to 4.5 per cent. We're cutting electricity costs by 25 per cent for 500,000 small businesses and farms, and we'll introduce measures to save business millions by cutting red tape and reducing unnecessary burdens through the Bill 154, the Cutting Unnecessary Red Tape Act 2017, and we'll continue to work with small business owners, leaving no stone unturned as we evaluate options to help them benefit from a strong economic growth being witnessed in every corner of this province, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, member from Lampton, Ken, Minnesota. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question to, is to the Minister of Small Business. It's Small Business Week, which is always a great opportunity to recognize the dedication of the hardworking people running the local businesses that are the lifeblood of our communities. Unfortunately, this year, Small Business Week comes at a time when many local businesses are on their heels after a decisive one-two punch from the Liberals. While Prime Minister Trudeau hikes their taxes from Ottawa, the Ontario Liberals are rushing to hike the minimum wage. Speaker, this is on top of the battering they've taken from high hydro rates, high taxes and an enormous debt that keeps uh, tax relief out of, out of reach. Speaker, is this government ever going to stand up for small business owners and family farms? Good question. Minister responsible for small business. And Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the honourable member for his questions this morning. And I know that he has a background in small business. I think his family owned a, I hope, hardware in Wallaceburg, Ontario. And so he, uh, he, has a background, uh, he has a background in this area. But I want to say we've. Uh, <laughs> made some real moves over the last number of years. We eliminated the capital tax and lowered small business tax rate to 4.5 percent, which is one of the most competitive small tax rates across Canada. We've reduced electricity costs for 25,000 by 25 percent for 500,000 small businesses and farms across the province of Ontario. Uh, we've been out uh, chatting with small businesses in every part of the province of Ontario. And we're looking forward when my colleague, the Minister of Finance, presents the fall economic statement and not to this in future, uh, to see what measures may be contained in there to Thanks, allow sir. small businesses to grow in every part of the province of Ontario. Thank you. Good answer. Good answer. Mr. Speaker, back to the Minister. The families running the businesses on Main Street, Ontario, don't want to hear a bunch of political jargon from this Liberal government. They want respect for the work they do and real answers to their concerns. Speaker, from the Ontario Chamber of Commerce to the Canadian Federation of Independent Business to the FAO, entrepreneurs and economists alike are telling this government they're on the wrong track. But the government continues to turn a deaf ear. For a government that seems to think the solution to every problem is a conversation, it's been shockingly difficult to get the Liberals to answer the outcry from small businesses. You hear it, Mr. Speaker, in coffee shops, town halls and constituency offices. Local businesses and farmers have been clear these proposed changes will hurt their businesses and their families. Speaker, how can this government continue to insist they know better than small business owners, economists, and even their Question. own FAO. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the member for his question and his supplementary. And 
In fact, uh, I've been going, uh, visiting uh, chambers right across the province of Ontario, and let me tell you, both uh, my local Chamber of Commerce in Peterborough and the Ontario Chamber provided us with uh, valuable analysis and uh, options that we're working to look at. As we say, that when it comes to what measures we may look at uh, down the road, we're leaving no stone unturned, and everything is on the table according to what options we look at. But the member's position is not quite the same as my good friend, the member from dufford Caledon who last Wednesday, I was at an announcement of her riding with Mars, and that Mars company told us they have absolute confidence in the growth of the economy in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The member from... Stop the clock. Just a reminder, we're in warnings. Just to let everybody remember that. The member from London West, a new question. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. This morning, more than 500,000 students woke up to learn that they would not be going to class today. One of those students, Calvin McDonnell, who is in his final year of the Environmental Technology Program at Fanshawe College, contacted me to share some very real concerns. He is worried that the laboratory experiments he requires for graduation will have to be restarted, potentially pushing back the completion date for his program. He is already carrying huge OSAP loans and is concerned about having to take on more debt. Speaker, what is this Liberal government doing to get the parties back to the bargaining table and ensure that students like Calvin are able to graduate on time without shouldering an increased debt load? Well, thank you, Speaker. And, um, students like Calvin are exactly who we are thinking about. And I, I know faculty, I know administration, everybody wants to get back into the classroom. Speaker, it's where students want to be, it's where faculty want to be. So the collective bargaining process is, is at play here, Speaker. Uh, we, we urge both sides to get back to the table, and uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that that will happen and a resolution will be, re will be reached soon. Supplementary. Speaker, I also heard from landscape design students at Fanshawe who have booked flights and purchased equipment for the program's annual education abroad opportunity in Italy and Spain. Many of the costs they have paid are non-refundable, and the entire trip is now in jeopardy. If the trip is cancelled, there are students who will have nowhere to live because they've given up their apartments, and they may not be able to complete their academic year. Speaker, faculty want fairness, and students want opportunities to learn. What is this Liberal government doing to get both faculty and students back into classrooms while making sure that students are not forced to carry an increased financial burden because of the strike? Thank you. Well, Speaker, uh, reading between the lines, I, I almost think I'm hearing the, the member opposite suggest that we legislate them back, and I don't think that is a position that the NDP would typically have. So I'm just going to assume that that is not their advice. But what I can tell you, Speaker, is there are students who are not in class today. We want both sides back together, and, and we want to reach an agreement as soon as possible, Speaker. This is, uh, this is what colleges exist for. They're extraordinary institutions doing very, very good work. And the faster they can get back together, the better. Thank you. Any question? The member from Brampton Springdale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Speaker, our government has made a clear commitment to expanding transit and transportation options in every corner of the province. I know that in Brampton, we're seeing critical investments like the Her Ontario LRT and the Go Regional Express Rail. These projects will bring better connections to more residents in my community, making it easier for them to get to school and to work and home again faster than they do now. But, Speaker, we need to make sure that our transit network is affordable so that commuters can make the choice to hop on board. That is why I'm very pleased to hear about our, that our government has taken a major step forward to reduce the cost of transit for people who rely on it each and every day. Speaker, through you to the Minister, would the Minister please provide more information on exactly how we're making transit more affordable for commuters in the GTHA? 
Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Well, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I want to begin by thanking the member from Brampton Springdale for her question and for her advocacy on behalf of her community. Speaker, just after the House adjourned for our constituency break, I was very pleased to be joining both Premier Kathleen Wynne and Mayor John Tory, Mayor of Toronto, to announce a historic agreement that will make it both easier and more affordable for commuters to get around our entire region. Effective this coming January, Speaker, when using your Presto card, it will cost only $1.50 to ride the TTC if your trip involves a transfer with Go Transit or the Union Pearson Express. That is half the cost of the regular TTC fare. This will have a significant impact on the pocketbooks of our commuters. On an average weekday, Speaker, 25,000 commuters from across the region make this exact connection, this exact trip. And those 25,000 individuals will, will save up to $720 per year on their commute, Speaker. Yes, so, Speaker, our government will keep working hard to make the commute easier and more affordable for the people across the region that we are proud to represent. Thank you, thank you very much. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his answer. During this past constituency week, I heard from count countless residents in my community who are pleased about the approximate $720 savings that they will uh, in the upcoming year. Speaker, I know this will help more than just current commuters. By making transit more affordable, we will encourage even more residents of the region to leave their cars at home. And we all know that getting cars off the road reduces congestion, which helps our economy grow and supports a clean environment that will be here for future generations. Speaker, I know that our government, under the leadership of our Premier, is working extremely hard to create a truly regional transit network that works for commuters and consistently attracts new ones. Would the minister please provide an update on how our government is doing, doing to create that network, as well as some progress to date? Thank you. Minister. Uh, speaker, thanks very much, and I thank the member for her follow-up question. You know, Speaker, over the last number of days, in addition to the specific announcement around the significant savings that we're going to be providing to commuters across the region starting in January with our discounted fare, Speaker, uh, just a few days ago I was, uh, I was in Durham, Speaker, I was in Whitby at what's known as the East Rail Maintenance Facility. Uh, this is more than half a million square feet adjacent to the 401 that's going to help us deal with maintenance and the upkeep for our vehicles as we build, Speaker, Go Regional Express Rail. This morning, I was with the member from Ajax Pickering. We are at the Ajax GO station, Speaker. That's a particular GO station in our network that has seen massive upgrades and improvements over the last number of years. And again, I want to stress, Speaker, as our government continues to enhance service in every corner of the GTHA, starting in January, we are going to make it significantly more affordable for commuters yes, to connect between GO and TTC or the Union Pearson Express and TTC, an average of roughly $700 a year Thank in annual you. savings, Speaker, while we're enhancing their service is good news for everybody. Thank you very much. Bruce Gray, one sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. For 14 years, this Liberal government has made life harder for Ontario families. We see the proof in the rise in mental health-related emergency department visits. The Hanover and District Hospital has been forced to contract police officers at a great cost to watch over some of these patients who are a danger to themselves and to others. Tragically, we are also seeing the proof in the growing number of suicides. This is a crisis that's destroying entire families in our great province. Despite your multiple capacity reviews and the moving on mental health strategy, Minister, please tell me, tell the people of Ontario, how many more children and people have to die by suicide before you take real action to stop this crisis? Thank you. Mr. Falcon, take care. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, Shame on you, Bill. For a while, I was completely aligned uh, with the member opposite. I think we do share the same goal in providing the highest quality mental health services for all Ontarians. And I've frequently said, Mr. Speaker, that there is no, and there can be no health without mental health and that we need to look at mental health as the other side of the coin of physical health, two sides of the same coin, and we need to invest at a level that provides that quality of care. And we are doing that, Mr. Speaker. We have doubled our mental health funding since coming into office to more than a billion dollars, Mr. Speaker. And our plan is to increase that funding by an additional $220 million over a period of three years. And we're seeing that investment in very specific and tangible ways. We're seeing that, for example, in Barrie at the Royal Victoria Hospital, where we have, I'm not sure if it's yet, if, if Answer. It's yet soon to be opened. Open, uh, mental health unit, acute mental health inpatient unit, and outpatient specifically for children and youth, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Yeah. Supplementary. 
Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. We do share a lot of, of, of thought process, but you know what? You can find $25 billion for an election ploy, but you can't find it for mental health. And I'm asking this question on behalf of the families, the families whose children you're letting slip through the cracks, who will be very disappointed to see you still haven't got a solution. One mother whose son, Tom, fell victim to these horrific wait times explains that since Tom took his life, she takes 18 antidepressants a day. And I quote, I will probably be on medication forever. Mine is another illness that could have been prevented. Minister, the impact in your inaction on Ontario families is too great to ignore. I ask you, can Judy Wisdom count on you today to take concrete action to stop the crisis in mental health? You know how you well, sir, Mr. Mr. Speaker, let's see, if, let's see if Hansard can keep up. We've added $16 million to create 1,000 more supportive housing spaces over three years, $48 million for specialized mental health services at St. Joseph's Care Group in Thunder Bay, $13 million for new primary mental health services at Regent Park in Toronto, $5 million to Youthdale Treatment Centre to open a 10-bed mental health unit for children and youth, $1.9 million through the government's Youth Suicide Prevention Plan, Mr. Speaker, $1.2 million for a new mental health and addictions crisis centre in London, $10 million to the Canadian Mental Health Association. Association in Waterloo, six million to hire approximately 80 new child and youth mental health workers. The list goes on and on, including an investment of 80 million dollars in this year's budget for supportive housing, for cognitive behavioral therapy, and other interventions specific to youth youth wellness centers that that member voted against. You see that, please. You see that, please. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. Over the Thanksgiving weekend, a toxic and foul-smelling cloud was emitted from the ArcelorMittal de Fasco site in Hamilton, sending a dark plume over the surrounding neighbourhoods as families were trying to enjoy their holidays. This is the latest example of what is known in the steel industry as a process called coffining. Meanwhile, this emitter has failed to meet its air pollution compliance standards for 2017, and instead of enforcing his own standards, the Minister of Environment and Climate Change has granted an extension. Instead of granting extensions, will the minister come to Hamilton and figure out how to put a stop to the dangerous air pollution? Thank you. Minister of Environment and Climate Change. To the environment and climate change. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker, and again, thank you uh, uh, for the question because it, it really uh, it, it really speaks to uh, uh, the incident and public, very public concern, uh, and and how seriously uh, our ministry takes these types of uh, uh, accidental uh, emissions. You know, uh, ministry staff met with the uh, DeFasco officials. Uh, this past Friday, Speaker, uh, to discuss the recent emissions, uh, that incident, and, and, and what actions the company is taking to reduce these types of incidents uh, going forward. Uh, we're told that the event was caused by a crane malfunction that required steel production to stop. Excess molten uh, iron had to be temporarily stored. Uh, they call it coffining. Uh, the emission happened when the molten iron was poured onto a damp coffining area. Uh, speaker, the company will also will be providing the ministry with quarterly reports so we can ensure the company is avoiding future incidents. Uh, we are discussing with the company. We will be meeting with the company to make sure this doesn't happen. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, we know that it is not impossible to comply with these air pollution standards. In fact, a similar steel facility nearby not only complies with the 2017 standards, but is currently exceeding the 2020 standards as well. When the minister selectively enforces the rules for emitters, it's not fair to businesses that follow the rules. Will the minister come to Hamilton himself? And will he meet with Environment Hamilton, with community groups, with businesses, with city councillors, local MPPs, and other stakeholders to figure out how to put an end to these coffining events once and for all? Thank you. Minister? Well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, you know, I'm open to uh, continuing to discuss with, uh, uh, with all stakeholders how we can improve air quality, not only in Hamilton, but in every city and town and area uh, right across the Ontario speaker. So I know that uh, 
uh, I know that, uh, that our ministry staff have implemented uh, an increased observation and, and, and measurement uh, of these coffining uh, emissions from this particular facility. We're increasing the amount of observation we're doing. We're increasing the amount of monitoring we're doing, uh, and we're going to uh, really make sure that, uh, that this particular facility uh, doesn't exceed those standards. We're going to minimize emissions associated with uh, those types of, uh, of uh, operations yes, there. So, Speaker, to summarize, I'm quite quite happy to talk to uh, to continue to talk with stakeholders uh, not only Thank in you. Hamilton but across Ontario. Question member from Kingston and the Islands. Thank you Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Speaker, Public Library Week gives us another chance to explore our local libraries and all that they have to offer. In 2015, 1,134 library service points across Ontario received over 72 million in-person visits. Our libraries help children learn, provide resources for students, and help small businesses and entrepreneurs. Last week, the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport was at the Burlington Central Library to help launch Ontario Public Library Week and to announce the shortlist for the Public Library Service Awards, one of the nominees being from my riding, Kingston Frontenac Public Library, for Viva Voce and the Juvenis Festival, Building Youth Capacity in the Arts. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can she tell the members of this House more about Library Question. Week? Thank you. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Merci, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the riding of Kingston and the Islands for not only her question but for her advocacy on behalf of libraries and her communities and beyond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to announce a special initiative to celebrate Library Week called Together We Read Ontario, a collaboration between two agencies of my ministry, the Ontario Media Development Corporation and the Southern Ontario Library Service. This joint initiative will highlight the work of talented Ontario authors by way of a provincial e-book club. During this week, Together We Read will feature two weeks, actually, of unlimited access to the e-book version of The Sweetest, Sweetest One by Melanie Ma, winner of the 2017 Trillium Book Awards. As well as providing fiction titles for our reading pleasure, our libraries support lifelong learning, provide resources for students and newcomers, and help small businesses and entrepreneurs thrive as resource yes, centres and community hubs across Ontario. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the Minister for that response. Libraries are the pillars of knowledge in our cities, towns, and local communities. And not only are they a resource to grab your favourite literary titles, but they're an integral tool when it comes to supporting our educational institutions. The services that libraries provide help to expand the knowledge and insight of the communities that they service and are meant to connect people to the resources in a way that is accessible and efficient, similar to the way that the Kingston Frontenac Public Library had a mobile unit at my barbecue this summer and actually lent out books right there in the park. The digital services funds will help to achieve that accessible and efficient level of service. Mr. Speaker, can the wonderful Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport please explain how this fund will support communities on a local level? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. Speaker, as the member noted, libraries are essential spaces and are a vehicle to spread knowledge within our communities. That's why we're continuing to make investments to libraries across Ontario. In fact, I'm delighted to say that we made this announcement, attended by library leaders from the Ontario Library Association at the beautiful main branch of the Burlington Public Library. I'm also pleased to announce that the Burlington Public Library will receive nearly $25,000 from the Improving Library Digital Service. Services Fund and the Kingston Frontenac County Public Library Board will receive more than $33,000. These are just two examples that are part of the $3 million investment that we're making province-wide. Speaker, under this government culture strategy, we made a pledge to continue to support services like libraries to contribute to and enhance the quality of life of our communities. Yes, we're very proud of our investments and we're looking forward to continuing them, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Halliburton, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community and Social Services. The terrible crime of human sex trafficking can be found in every corner of Ontario and in, in, in increasingly in our small cities and towns. In fact, Kortha Halliburton Victim Services in my writing has helped 21 human sex trafficking victims since December alone. It's a shocking statistic in a community like Lindsay. 
A group of victim service providers from Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Peterborough and Northumberland applied for support from the government's anti-human trafficking community support fund, but they were rejected. So were frontline organizations in Kingston, Belleville, Prince Edward County, Orangeville, Leeds Grenville, Hamilton and Niagara, just to name a few. My question is, will the minister ensure the, that frontline organize, organizations like those in my region receive the support they need and deserve to save the lives of Question. victims. Thank you. <laughs> Minister Community and Social Service. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for this uh, really important question. And I know that uh, the member opposite is uh, uh, certainly uh, a wonderful advocate uh, in her own community for uh, these services that are so vital. Uh, because, of course, uh, she must know that our strategy to end human trafficking uh, has been launched, is extremely active. The Minister of the Status of Women and I recently made uh, a major announcement regarding funds available to communities uh, to prevent and assist with the survivors of this heinous crime. And uh, we certainly are providing sustained community supports to help survivors repair their lives. Uh, we're providing more help to train our justice sector partners, investigate and prosecute these crimes. This is a very complicated situation involving a number of our Answer. ministries, and uh, we are doing everything we can uh, to ensure that uh, we help the survivors of human trafficking. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, back to the minister. It, it appears that the government's approach is to wash their hands and say we spent the budget amount and we're done. That's not acceptable, Mr. Speaker. Saving lives of human sex trafficking victims is not a bureaucratic box that you can just tick and move on from. The government left many frontline victim service organizations with the impression that they would have access to much of the $72 million figure that the government often likes to quote. The truth is, they only ever had access to 18 million, one quarter of that amount. How can this government claim to be doing enough when so many human trafficking survivors remain without the help they so desperately need? Thank you. Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I really do resent some of the uh, uh, implications of what was said by the member opposite. On this side of the House, we take this crime extremely seriously. We have established an anti-human trafficking office uh, led by a survivor of human trafficking herself. Uh, the ministries of the Attorney General, the Ministry of uh, Con uh, Community Safety and Corrections, the Minister of the Status of Women, and my ministry are all involved in having a very thoughtful approach to this particular problem. Uh, it is not a simple problem. It takes coordinated action, and we ensure that those agencies that apply for funding are going to receive what they need to combat this Answer. crime in their area. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. A member from Windsor, Tecumseh, on a point of order. Uh, thank you, Speaker. On a point of order, I'd like to introduce a friend of mine in the uh, Members West Gallery today, Blake Roberts. He teaches political science at Wayne State University in Detroit and at the University of Windsor, a former CBC colleague. Welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you. Welcome. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.